I think it is uh, very difficult for everybody because um, in a way you need to stay present and therefore the, the connection, the everyday connection is important. Um, but, but equally, I think in our, the strength of our organization is that we are very much into empowerment. If one of us would be sidelined completely, um, the rest of the pack would pick up the ball and run with it. And that is um, a benefit, I guess, that is, um, that is spe special to the, to the Mercedes F1 team. Toto, it's good to see you. And I really mean see you because I think at the moment it's really reassuring to stay connected with people, to actually see people on screens, even though it's virtually. Yeah, I think it helps a lot. This is the benefit of technology. We're talking a lot about the downside of being permanently online and uh, in, on social media. But in these days where everybody has to be um, uh, self-isolated, the, the possibility of FaceTiming or video conferencing indeed helps. Of course, at a time like this, as a leader, you would normally bring your team together to, to reassure them, to make sure that everyone was feeling um, supported. But of course, that's something you just absolutely cannot do at the moment. How are you managing that on a practical level to, to lead the team? I think it is uh, very difficult for everybody because um, in a way you need to stay present and therefore the, the connection, the everyday connection is important. Um, but, but equally, I think in our, the strength of our organization is that we are very much into empowerment. If one of us would be sidelined completely, um, the rest of the pack would pick up the ball and run with it. And that is um, a benefit, I guess, that is, um, that is special to the, to the Mercedes F1 team. I'm going to come back to that theme of empowerment a little bit later on, but just about the here and the now. What are you focusing on at the moment and what have you been focusing on over the last few weeks? The most important now is the health and well-being of um, all of us, our families and our friends and um, our colleagues in, in the team and in Daimler. And I think you have seen uh, various uh, data and rumors spreading around. You hear about singular cases that are real outliers um, that um, shouldn't be affected as badly as they are. And um, add to the equation the various strategies of the, of the government, uh, governments, um, Austria, my home country, um, adopting a very early lockdown policy. And three weeks later, the, the virus is on its way down and the government is thinking about reopening, um, uh, slowly reopening the normal life. And then you see Sweden has adopted a to totally different strategy. They, everything remained basically um, um, as before, um, adding, adding the component of um, social distancing, and, and others have been in total lockdown. So we are really um, fighting an unknown enemy here, and therefore Formula One is an entertainment platform and a sport, and we're all missing it. Um, but I think we have to contribute um, to what everybody's doing to, to, to help to... Uh, reduce the cases and uh, get ourselves, all of us, out of this terrible phase. Absolutely. I'd like to go back now to the time you became team principal at the team. And I want to ask you about how you approached that. Did you know what type of leader you were going to be? No, not really. I, my background is in finance and the organization that I run was um, 27 individuals, investment individuals. and. Um, and uh, the daily management was actually done by somebody else. And when I launched myself into Williams, I started as a non-executive director. And when the CEO decided to, to call it a day, I was suddenly in an in a operational position. And that worked pretty well in, 2000, in 2012. And then one door opened and the next door opened. And Mercedes asked me whether I was prepared to step in a managing role and becoming their joint venture partner, which sounded very exciting at the time and here we go eight years later uh, or in our eighth year um, I've been um, managing this, um, this company to the best of my ability. I hope I can still contribute. We've won six, six championships and that is a pretty good record. A lot of people when they're sort of navigating the style of leadership that they want to, to have draw on experiences from past careers, past jobs. What experience did you draw on? And that can be sort of, you know, if your old boss was very, uh, very strict, you want to have a much more laissez-faire attitude. How, how have you managed to, to 
collate all of your experience and then have a, a satisfactory style of leadership? I never had a boss in, in, in my life because I was uh, I started very early with my own um, with my own business. Um, but I read a lot, and whilst watching from the sidelines at Williams and at HWA, the team that runs the DTM cars, I was able to 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 follow um, different management styles, and they went from really micromanagement, being into every detail. Uh, and then the non-empowerment of individuals to, on the very other side, letting uh, almost not having any leash and letting everybody go in all, all kinds of directions. And from, from, from that on, I developed my, my own way of, of tackling it. And I believe it's all about hiring and developing the right individuals, forming a culture and the team spirit around them, and then defining the core objective. And once that is defined, we leave it to each other in our respective fields to deliver on the core objective. And that is something that you can't simply put on a PowerPoint, but it takes many years to actually live it. And we've been so far doing quite well. You've spoken in the past about having that objective, having the passion, which you obviously have for the job. I'm sure you wouldn't have stayed in it for as long as you, as you did have as, if you didn't. Um, but also the key element being purpose. How do you establish that purpose? And what does that word really mean to you? For me, purpose is the single most important driver in your life. Um, they, I read a nice comment somewhere that defined happiness, and it is three pillars. It's somebody to love, something to do, and something to dream of. And I think purpose is very much the combination of the latter two. Uh, you need to enjoy what you do, and you need, to, you need to have a dream that you want to fulfill. There needs to be a target that is almost visible in form of a blueprint of yourself um, in, in front of yourself that you want to achieve. And uh, these targets may vary from person to person, but it's very important to define these targets and then just um, try to achieve them. And that gives personally, that, they give, that gives me purpose. I heard a wonderful story about when you started at the team, you brought everyone together for a team briefing. And at the end, someone turned to you and said, nice words, let's see if it happens. I can imagine you're faced with people being skeptical at, at all points of your job. How do you deal with that? How do you convince them to follow your, your thought process, your intent and, and your objective? You can only lead by example. That first town hall that I did was, was remarkable because when everybody left the room, there was one guy from the machine shop floor that was there for a long, long time. And my last words were, trust me, Daimler is behind this and I'm going to stay in here for for many years and this team is going to return to where it should be. The Mercedes Formula One works team should be fighting at the forefront um, of the grid. And he passed by me as one of the last leaving the room and said, nice words, we've heard them many times. And, it, and I realized you can only actually live by your own standard and by your own objectives every single day. And then slowly but surely this will cascade down in the organization and everybody's going to follow your lead and the lead of my colleagues that are the heads of departments or that are the layers through the company. Every single layer is important to align with this core objective. Two key words that you've mentioned, they're most recently being trust. And then when we started speaking, you spoke about empowerment. And those two are so important, I would imagine, when you're running a big team and a big company. You have to let people go and, and continue running the business, perhaps when you aren't physically there at a time like this, and of course, when you're traveling the world. How do those two work symbiotically, the trust and the empowerment? It works very well with us. And I've seen on occasions where some of us were traveling, traveling a lot, some of us were ill or busy with other topics, be it privately, personal topics, or um, um, stuck in a project. And we were always able to continue to make the ball run. And this is something that is, that is making me very proud. If I'm, if I'm traveling or I'm, I'm, if I'm having days where I feel like I, I need to concentrate on something else, I can give uh, James Allison a call or Rob Thomas a call and say, guys, I'm offline for the next 48, 72 hours because I just got to do this. And I know that with a brief about the objectives of topics that are outstanding, they will do as good as a job as I do, even in my field. And that is a very reassuring and comfortable feeling. 
you often talk about the no blame culture that you have and the win and we lose, we win and we lose together um, sort of quote and slogan that you live by. Um, how do you let that play out day to day, the no blame culture? Because that's, that's quite a tricky one to, to keep engendered in a team. It's a very tricky one because it's easy to comprehend on a rational level, but the human mind is structured in a way that's when something happens, when a problem comes up in the race um, or a path fails, the human nature will always be it's your fault because that allows me to release pressure. And that understanding that is an important first step that it's just a pressure release valve for yourself. So what I'm trying to do is to calm myself down, be emotional, but not overexcited about the situation. And I think we all know each other really well. And, and the guys that are part of the racing team, they know that I will have good moments and bad moments. Um, but it's important to recalibrate yourself, recondition yourself, and then say, okay, what's, what has actually gone wrong? And only if you're calm, reflected, but also emotional leader, people will be able to come out of their, let's say, hiding spaces and say, I think we should have done that. Or that or this and, um, and only, I think this is a very important ingredient to make the team progress, to uncover every problem that, that has come up and not blame the person. So where does ego sit within leadership? Because you need to be a strong person to lead a team, but does that allow for an ego to appear? Oh, that's a very difficult question because I think ego can be a very strong driver. Um, but only to a certain limit. I've seen big egos fail. Most of the big egos that were not able to self-reflect fail because they, were, they believed they were the real deal, be it in Formula One or somewhere else. I believe in um, somehow um, personal, in personal skepticism. We all suffer a little bit from the imposter syndrome. Are we really contributing what other people think we are? And, and I think that keeps you grounded. You question yourself all the time. And, um, and therefore, keeping the ego in control is very important. Formula One is not the most important topic in the world. There's things that are, that are just overwhelming, like the coronavirus at the moment. And, um, and when you look at our little microcosmos, uh, some in that focus think that Formula One is the most important. But you have to acknowledge that. Maybe it's the most important for them. Maybe there's nothing else that really interests them, and that's why their universe circles around Formula One. But it doesn't give you the necessary detachment of the sport, and I think that's important. Do you think anyone can be a leader? I think anyone who feels comfortable in taking responsibility and being, feeling accountable for things can be a leader. When you're standing on the top of the mountain, the view is great, but it's very lonely. You have to burden the... Um, all the responsibility, the buck stops with you. You are accountable. If things go wrong for a long time, you need to take responsibility. And that's why that's not for everybody. Some people are more structured in a way that, uh, that, they, that they follow a single task. They want to deliver it to the highest of perfection. Some think they are maybe not the best people managers because working alone is more what they enjoy and what where they, where, they, where they are good in. And others want to manage a large organization. So you have to just ask yourself, what is it that I can contribute to? What is it where I think I'm, I'm uh, maybe better than the average? How do you make sure you are progressing as a leader? Because it's difficult if you've got people around you that perhaps say yes a lot. How do you make sure that you are still, still growing as a team principal and a leader? I make sure that they don't say yes a lot. Uh, First of all, I don't, mean, I don't want to be called a leader um, because there's many leaders in the organization and not, the, not the just the ones that are visible in front of the camera or that speak for the team. Uh, there's many that lead their departments and their little groups and even their work in a very effective way. And um, in that respect, we are a group of 2,000 leaders in the Mercedes Motorsport program on the engine side and on the chassis side. This has obviously given us uh, a time for self-reflection, a time for thinking. What do you think this, this terrible crisis could give us in terms of opportunity for the future? I think it makes us appreciate more the small things. Going for a walk, if we are allowed to, uh, spending time with your family and your kids, 
actually not rushing back from the office, doing a little bit of la di da with your little one for five minutes and then uh, getting on the next phone call, but spending time. And that is difficult. And I can tell you that I'm struggling with these things. It's a completely new life. I have more free time, although I'm on the phone a lot. Um, and this morning, I've spent a long time with my three-year-old, which, uh, which is totally new and I enjoy, but it also, of course, is different. And, um, and then on the other side, I have my elder children that are in Vienna in, in isolation, um, which, by the way, I think was the right call from the Austrian government to do. Um, and I haven't seen them for six weeks, which is very painful indeed. So all that is difficult times for all of us. Sometimes have it a, some of us have it a little bit easier with the amount of space that is available or the amount of activity. Others less, but we will come out better. Um, we will come out stronger. Um, rough seas make good sailors. Whilst you're in, it just doesn't feel good. But when you're coming out of this, we will be a different society with different values, with a different mindset. Well, Toto, thank you so much. Enjoy your time with your family. Enjoy some time of self-reflection. And we look forward to seeing what we'll all be like when we come out of this period of our lives. Okay. Thank you, Rosanna. And uh, hi to everybody. You fell over? Yeah, I don't know. We'll go again.